Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is David Witten. I'm the coordinator of keyboard studies here at Cali School of Music, and I'm also the chair of the International Committee for the Cali School. Now, today's topic is studying abroad. Now, you may be surprised about this topic, especially in these days of pandemic, which has gone on far longer than we wanted or expected. We're all waiting and hoping for a viable vaccine and one day we will feel safe enough to travel and move about and even study abroad. So today's topic is actually about the future. Now I wanna share screen for a moment. So studying abroad in the future. Now, I always like to think about the wonderful Greek historian Thucydides. He was a very wise and imaginative writer, and he gave this wonderful metaphor for time. He imagined, he imagined man standing in the river of time, facing the past, not facing the future, but looking behind, facing the past, and seeing events more and more clearly as they receded into the distance. That has to be part of our approach. So sometime in the future, we will look at the past and re realize the pandemic is over. Hopefully in the future, we will be able to send students abroad and have that experience. Now, for those of you who are first year students, it's particularly appropriate at this time to start thinking about it because it's widely agreed that the third year of college is the optimal time to spend a semester or even a full year abroad. In fact, it used to be called the junior year abroad. Some schools still do call it the junior year abroad. Today, we will have a short interview with a recent Cali School graduate who spent her entire junior year abroad in Graz, Austria. I'll introduce her in a moment. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we're back now and I have my special guest who I'm going to introduce right now. It's Maddie Meyer. She's a wonderful singer, vocalist, and she studied for a year in Graz. Maddie, say hello. Hi. <laughs> so Maddie, was it your junior year or your senior? Which year was it for you? Yeah, so it was my junior year. Um, the year before, and then I spent my last year at uh, Montclair again. Right. As I said um, earlier in this, in this portion, uh, junior year abroad is how it used to be called, even though it's just called study abroad. Uh, junior year very often works out best for everyone's schedule. Uh, so Maddie, I'm going to share the screen and we're going to see some photos that you will be familiar with because you took them, not this one. This was uh, the quote about looking, looking, facing the past. So you see the events more and more clearly as they recede into the distance. That's Thucydides. Oh. So. so now, ladies and gentlemen, Austria is one of several destinations that we offer for music students, particularly Graz, Austria. And for those not so familiar with the map of Europe, here's a quick map. You see Austria just northeast of Italy. And in this small one, you see Vienna, the capital, of course. In this side, you can see Vienna and Graz is south, kind of southwest and Maddie, how long a train ride is it between Vienna and Graz? So it's about, and I, you can take bus or train. And I know that the bus was a two and a half hour ride. So it's pretty close. And I think the train is maybe a bit, it's around the same amount of time, I would assume. But I always took the bus into Vienna. Um, but to some areas of, of 
Austria, you do have to take the train. Like I went to Innsbruck and you can only take the train. So it just depends, but it's a really short train ride. It's really close. Which one's close? The Graz Vienna? Yeah, the Graz Vienna. I do know it's close. I'm assuming it's probably around two and a half to three hours as well. Right. You can just do a day trip and come back the same day. Yeah. Great. Okay, now to get to Europe, to get to Austria, you need to fly there. Well, you could take a, a steamship, I suppose. But here, here's some details. If people are particularly interested, I can send them this in more detail. But it's a wonderful university. It's in, actually, Graz is a university town. There are several schools there. And here's a photo of the downtown, uh, the open plaza. Is this pedestrian only, Maddie? Yeah, it's pedestrian only. No cars in this area. Only right. They only have the street cars going on either side. Um, and then if you go up into the um, surrounding roads, it's all like cobblestone and it's, it's really beautiful. Great. So of course, Austria was the site of the famous story about the trap family and there's julie andrews do you happen to know what mountains he's on i don't i do know it's like around salzburg and i know i i watched an interview with her and she actually mentioned when she it, it filmed this exact scene she had to do it multiple times um and they had helicopters flying around from the top <laughs> filming her it was crazy <laughs> oh that's cool so yeah. So, Maddie, are the hills really alive with the sound of music? I think they are. <laughs> Good. In fact, here's again Julie Andrews. And what is this building? Where? What is the location of this? So that's a um, cathedral. It's it's they have the actual gardens that you can visit, and it's a little um, it's a little building right next to the gardens. And um, I forget the name of the gardens actually, but that's where they filmed. It's in Salzburg and that's where they filmed. Ah, it's in Salzburg. Yeah. So Maddie so much wanted, she wanted so much to live this. Here she is. <laughs> <laughs> Recreating that wonderful scene. Now tell us what this is. So that's actually the opera house in Graz. It's so beautiful and it's ornate. And I'm assuming it's kind of, I guess, like baroque art, but I took a picture of the ceiling because it's just, it's so beautiful to be in. Right. And did you attend the opera there or a concert or what? I did. You can get free, you can, well, nearly free tickets. Like I would pay like, seven to fifteen dollars for tickets and the same goes for the big Staatsoper in Vienna it's so cheap especially if you're a student and that's one of the beautiful things about getting to study um, in Austria is they really value um, the classical arts so it's it's and it's government funded so you, you don't have to pay these huge funds to go and see an orchestra or an opera. And it's such a major learning experience if you're in school studying that type of music. Yeah, it's wonderful. Tell us the reason you photographed the peacock. <laughs> well, I, well, peacocks are my favorite bird. I don't know why, but <laughs> I, they had them. So there's something called the Schloss Egenberg in, um, in Graz and I think in the early 1900s, they imported a bunch of peacocks from Japan to the the um, castle, and they <laughs> kept them there. So they they're just running around, you know, and you see them all the time when you're at Schloss Egenberg. But I got really excited about this one because I actually saw I saw him, and then he put out his feathers. And I, so I actually got a video of him putting out his feathers and then I took a, a, a photo of him and I, I just thought it was so beautiful. <laughs> yeah, it's perfect. Yeah, it's fill, it fills up even more space than your camera lens could fit. <laughs> I know. <laughs> 
And here, th is this still, this is not Graz, this is Vienna, isn't it? Yeah, so this is Vienna. Um, and it was just a little street in Vienna. You can see the cobblestones. Like there are areas of both in Graz and Salzburg and Vienna and all those cities actually where you can't have cars in certain areas because of the cobblestones. And so they're really good about like kind of preserving that history, which I think is really beautiful about the city. And I thought it captured, you know, kind of the personality of the city and the people. Um, I feel like it's just, it's such a, it's a big city, um, but it's quiet and it's peaceful and the architecture is just so beautiful to me. So that's why I took that photo. Right, and that building on the left has so many things to look at high yeah. up and also just near the entrance. Oh, there's yeah. incredible statues. Yeah. completely different this is the countryside <laughs> yeah so i was really lucky i made friends with um someone from austria who i still keep in touch with today but for my birthday she had me go to klagenfurt which is a rural area of austria which i think that the rural areas are actually some of my favorite areas because you get the mountains and it's it's just so beautifully picturesque but i got to stay with her and her family for a week and and speak nothing but german so i really got the language in my ears and this was taken with her dog on one of our hikes um just outside of klagenfurt it was a little town and barely any would see these are all kind of like farms and vacation homes no one really stays there year round so it's it, there weren't a lot of people there and it was just so beautiful do you happen to remember what month that was? It was it was around April. It was it was mid April, I think. So it was still cooler, and the weather in Austria, depending on where you are, it varies because the nature is so diverse there. But it it gets rainy in some areas. Um, so this was like one of those rainy days. Um, but it's like living in the Pacific Northwest, I guess. If you've ever been there, like it's just like a misty rain, you know, you, it doesn't really require you to have any umbrella or anything. Right. Nice, beautiful. So this was actually taken in Hallstatt. Um, I took a little day trip there. On that same week I was staying with my, or not Hallstatt, it was, um, it's a different, yeah, was it Hallstatt? Yeah, it was Hallstatt. Was it? No, it wasn't Hallstatt. I forget the city. <laughs> but it's still in Austria? It's not in Aust Austria. It's actually in Slovakia. We went and we visited and we took a day trip and um, it was just so beautiful. Um, oh, it was Blades. That's what it was. Sorry, I totally just like, <laughs> like I, get, I have a horrible memory. <laughs> but we took a day trip there and we sat and we sat in this cafe and had coffee right outside of this beautiful river. And honest to God, this picture doesn't even do it justice. It's just like the feeling of being there with these mountains. It was just so unbelievable. And it was just nice to be surrounded by so much nature. So yeah. it was a day trip. And it was, it was just like, we did it for my birthday again. It was this whole week of festivities. So I got to, and it's so inexpensive to travel there to like surrounding countries and stuff that it was nice to take the little day trip and um see the area the the um area of blade and the people there yeah it's a breathtaking photo and the weather looks perfect there it was it was a good day <laughs> good. and here completely different yeah so this was taken i went hiking in austria um I hiked a mountain. I'd never hiked a mountain before. And it's the best experience. I think that if you're in Austria, you should definitely go hiking in the mountains. And I never got an opportunity and I regret it, but I think you should definitely try skiing because that's a huge thing in Austria. So we ran into a lot of skiers along the way. But hiking mountains is just so just so special because you're working so hard to get up the mountain and then you get there and you're so tired but you have this breathtaking view. And that's what I love about Austria. I think that I, I just love being in the mountains. That's something that I personally love. So getting to do this was just so special. 
Yeah, you can tell from your face how much you're enjoying it. <laughs> Good. And then is this from the same mountain? So yeah, it was from the same mountain. So you got all these different views. That was actually from a lower part of the mountain. You can tell I'm kind of looking up. Um, but in the previous photo, I was higher. So I got more of a, a view of the mountains from like a level, a level <laughs> place. So I guess, um, but yeah, so this was, this was at the same place. And you can see the tiny little villages. I don't know if you can see that, but if you look down, you can, those little white dots, those are actually small little different villages in Austria. You and when you here? fly above Austria, you can actually see that there are so many tiny little dwarfs, like that's the word for village in German. And that's how it is in Austria, because you really, Vienna is huge. Um, and Graz is actually the second largest city. It's actually bigger than Salzburg, even though more people probably know about Salzburg, but they can't really build so many big cities in Austria because of the nature and because of the mountains. So they kind of have these little compact areas, you know, where they can build tiny little towns. Mm -hmm. Right. And once you're fluent in German, you can just freely uh, roam around and walk around, get your coffee. Mit Schlag oder yeah. ohne. But you know, it's, yeah, it's really interesting too, because, because of the history of Austria, um, all of the different cities, like you have a Viennese dialect of German, and then you have, you know, a Graz dialect of German. And so it's interesting to hear that and to kind of wrap your brain around that. And I think in school, since I majored in German, we learned primarily Hochdeutsch. So getting to Austria at first, I was like, oh my God, I don't know this language. <laughs> now I'm used to it. But it, it's so fun to hear the different sounds. Um, I, I think it's really interesting. And then you have, you know, Switzerland German, which is totally different too. And then, you know, Bavarian German, it's all different. <laughs> Yeah, on one of my long ago trips to Vienna, I actually went to theater to see a German production of My Fair Lady. And they did all the different accents, you know, Hochdeutsch and Schweizerdeutsch and all the v Viennese dialects. <laughs> it's really fun. Um, I know that like when you're singing German operetta, for example, because that, or uh, Austrian operetta, it's so specific to Austria that they oftentimes want to cast people who do have that Austrian accent in the dialogue. It's really interesting. It's cool. Right. Cool. I think there's one more. This, do you remember where this photo is? Oh, so that is the Staatsoper in Vienna. Oh, um, Vienna, okay. Yeah, so that's the huge opera house. And if you go to Graz, you have to go to Vienna multiple times i would say mm -hmm. but you have to go and you have to go to the opera house it's just so beautiful on the outside and in the inside um and if i could i would go back you know and see if they have all these you know top-notch singers coming to the opera house and where you sometimes have to pay more money in the u.s to see some of these singers you can go to the opera house in Vienna and pay $7 for a ticket. And so I would just go into the city when I, there was an opera that I wanted to see or a singer that I wanted to see. Mm -hmm. And I would pay $7 for a ticket and then just spend the night with a friend in Vienna. <laughs> and it was just, it was so fun. And I think that in addition to getting that wonderful education at the conservatory half of what I learned from studying abroad was through traveling and getting to go and on little day trips like this. So I think that if you ever study abroad, really take that seriously and save your money. Uh, travel is pretty inexpensive there. The trips are less expensive, but save your money to go and take trips like that because it's really worth it. And two years later, I'm, I'm just so grateful for that experience. And I learned so much and I grew so much as a person, you know? Sure, well, we certainly hope you'll get to go back one day. Yeah, I hope so too. It's it's interesting times, but I'm I'm it's I'm glad that I got that experience. Okay, this might be the last photo. Okay, so this is actually Hallstatt. That's why I got confused. <laughs> you see so many mountains, it's like ah. Oh. <laughs> but this I see I love taking photos like this with the little towns and then the mountains surrounding them because I think it captures kind of what it feels like you feel kind of small, you know, um, but this, so Hallstatt, you go and you can only take a train there and then you get to the train station and you get a little ticket 
and then you can only get into the city by taking a, a boat into the city. And it's so, it's so interesting. It's, yeah. It's wonderful, wonderful. Yeah, it's fun. Okay, thanks for explaining those photos. Um, tell us a little about, about the Sister City Scholarship. I know the connection of Montclair Gratz was the very, very first Sister City connection going back to the 1950s. Yeah, so, um, the scholarship is ba basically because we have connections with Graz. Um, we have, so in Austria, how it works is they have university, universities that specialize in certain things. So they have the technology university in Graz, they have the conservatory in Graz, and then they have the liberal arts university in Graz. And we have connections with all of those universities. So the scholarship uh, if you're a music student, you can apply for the scholarship. If you're doing anything in computer science, you can. Um, and so when I applied, I not only had to apply for the scholarship, but then you have to audition for the conservatory. Um, and so I had to write, um, I had to write to get the scholarship a few essays and obviously send in my transcript. And then I got a, um, I got called in for an interview. So then they have the interview portion. And then after the interview, you find out if you get the scholarship and they award it to two people. And I was lucky enough to be one of those two people. Um, and they really take care of the people in Austria who do get the scholarship. So when you get there, you get health insurance and you get a special advisor who kind of shows you around and shows you, you know, all the places, you know, in the city and you have like people that you can contact to help you if you have any, you know, issues. Um, and it's a really great scholarship. And I think that if you can, you should apply for it. Um, yeah, because it, it was really special. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, everyone, please apply. We can help you get the application. This uh, currently things are kind of dormant, as you know, because of the pandemic, but hopefully that'll clear up and we will be able to send students again. So again, this is for the future, your airplane flight. You don't have to jump out of the plane. Uh, but there's my email address if anyone wants to ask questions or, or have particular uh, issues they want to discuss about this. Okay, I'm going to stop sharing the screen for a moment. So thank you so much, Maddie. That was very informative and your enthusiasm is priceless. <laughs> <laughs> Yay! <laughs> now, well, I'm happy. I'm happy to do it. <laughs> great. Now, ladies and gentlemen, uh, you're now going to see a video that that we made about two and a half years ago that was presented live in Leshwitz Theater, again, about the study abroad um, there's a few little differences from two and a half years ago, uh, like the membership of the committee is a little different, and you will hear about five different countries, but it's only the first three that are currently viable, the most viable, and that those countries are Norway, it's Agder University and Christiansen, Norway, Austria, the one that Maddie's been talking about, the Universität für Musik und Darstellende Kunst Graz. How is that? Did I get it? It was good. Yeah, you got it. <laughs> and finally, Italy, also very active. Conservatorio di Musica Giuseppe Verdi, <laughs> formerly called the Milan Conservatory. So you'll also hear about Hungary and Russia. Those are programs that are not currently active. But if you really, really want to go there, contact us. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. And keep watching. You're going to see the next video. Thanks very Thank much. You. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this session. We're going to talk about the opportunities for Cali School music students to study in other countries, to study abroad. There's five countries we want to present, but don't worry, there's more if you really have a desire to go to a country that's not mentioned. So we'll talk about all of that. Uh, I'm David Witten. I'm the coordinator of keyboard studies, but I'm also now chair of the international committee at the Cali School. 
And the other members of the committee are uh, Lori McCann, you see the names listed here, Lori McCann and Marissa Silverman, who's with us today, and Jeff Gall and Marcos Walter. And we're all available to answer your questions if you see us in the hall or the ballpark or anywhere. We'll answer your questions. Um, when college graduates are pulled long after they went to college, they always have two regrets, not having studied abroad and not having learned a second language. Don't let this happen to you. You can see the world. You get personal enrichment, cultural awareness, academic credit, certainly. Don't worry about that. You gain a new perspective in your own field. Language immersion. Did I spell immersion correctly? Good. <laughs> Professional edge. And why study abroad? Because you can. It allows um, all Montclair State University students have an opportunity to study in another country. You're still an MSU student even when you're studying abroad, so you, you don't lose your enrollment or anything like that. You do receive credit. Uh, you can study for one semester or two semesters. And you can take major or minor parts of your class. Now there's three questions that are always in your mind when you're interested in studying abroad. And I'll show you the three questions, and, but we will wait till the end of the session to actually answer them. The three questions, of course, are, will I be paying more than the usual tuition? Do I need to know a foreign language? And will it lengthen my studies at MSU? Okay, your questions and more will be answered before you leave today. Now, for the entire University of Montclair, there are many destinations, as I mentioned, and here you have a nice map that's pointing to the many. Specifically for music students, um, we have five conservatories and music schools around the world, and uh, before we go into detail, here's a quick survey of them. Uh, Conservatorio de Musica Giuseppe Verdi in Milan, Italy. Uh, Universität für Musik und Darstellende Kunst Graz in Austria, Graz, Austria. Aachen University in Norway, very beautiful place in southern Norway. Moskowskaya Gasu Garnes from the Conservatorio Imni Pyotr Ilyich Tchaikovskaya, known as the Moscow Conservatory in Moscow, and finally, Liszt Ehrenz Academy of Music in Budapest. Before I go on, I want to introduce my friend and colleague who's here, Domenica Dominguez. She's the leader of the Global Education Center. So she'll also be speaking. So first, Milan. There, you have to get in your airplane. So Milan, as you may know, is in northern Italy. Can you see the point here? Northern Italy. Uh, first music, which of course would be the reason you're going there. Uh, some words about the conservatory. Do you want to speak to this one? Oh, sure. um, so, uh, both ways. So they send their students here for a semester or an academic year, and we can send, uh, nominate our students to go there for a semester or academic year. Uh, and I'll also point out in the audience now, uh, Stefano, who is here from the Milan Conservatory, studying at Montclair State for a semester, uh, studying electronic music, primarily? Yes, yes. So um, Stefano can answer any questions specific to the conservatory here. But in general, um, the way it works is you go for the fall or the spring semester or the full year. Uh, they're on a bit of a different academic calendar than we are. So uh, if you go for the fall semester, uh, you correct me if I'm wrong, but the semester usually starts around the 1st of October, early October. Mm -hmm. November. November? November. 
I'll get into the end of January or? Yeah, it's the end of February. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's even later than That's later. why it's difficult for our yeah. students to do the first semester there, but certainly second semester is much more simple. Or for the full year, if you go for the full year. Otherwise, you wouldn't be back in time for the spring semester here. Um, you do have, you should have some background in Italian in order to be nominated, but you don't have to be fluent or even highly proficient. Um, you sh uh, unless if your voice, you should have more, but otherwise, just some familiarity with Italian, enough to be able to get around. Um, there are some Italian languages, course, uh, Italian language courses available that you can take, but primarily since it's conservatory, you'll be focusing on your music performance while you're there. There's a list of um, areas where you can study, uh, but the way it works and the way it's going to work with all of these institutions is once you decide where you think you want to go, you can go to their website, talk to your advisor, and start exploring the courses and the academic disciplines that are available. But really, unlike at Montclair State, where you would just kind of get online and choose your courses, we would be working, your advisor would be working with the faculty there in your area to determine specific program for you, especially. Um, is there another piece of that? Yeah, go Yeah, that's important. Uh, details like where you will live, uh, whether it's a dormitory or with a family or apartments, that can all be worked out on an individual basis. Uh, here's actually the entrance of the conservatory in Milan. And on the left is the church, uh, say the name? Right. And here's the inside the courtyard. It's very, very beautiful. And there's one tree. <laughs> now, another opportunity of living in in Italy is, you, as music students, you really, really learn the meaning of the word appoggiatura, which is the most expressive two-note event in music, as you know. It's the leaning note. And for example, if you go in any time in the subway car, you'll see non appoggiar, so it means don't lean. It's the same word. So lean, you lean on the bad note, it resolves to the good note. Here you see the danger, the real danger of leaning. And every two years, they change the sign. I don't know why. This was the most uh, definitively scary sign, but a few years later they did this one, where the guy doesn't look in danger at all of uh, falling. It's just like hanging out. <laughs> and two months ago I was there, I've been there several times, but two months ago I was there teaching the uh, Talman technique, a very safe way of playing piano. And that guy close to me in the red shirt, there's another see him there. He looks remarkably like the actor Kiefer Sutherland. And, and I, I asked him, I said, you know who Kiefer Sutherland is? And he, he didn't speak any English. So I explained, I showed him a picture. A picture. He said, yeah, people, when we got a translator, he said, yeah, people tell me I look like some American actor. <laughs> but that, you may or may not meet him. <laughs> uh, now, this was a class by two Italian professors who came here four years ago. Uh, you see Massimiliano Baggio on the left, standing, and Cristina Falsini. They were both piano teachers. And the interesting fact about this is now, four years later, Cristina Falsini is director of the entire conservatory. And Massimiliano, Massimiliano Baggio is vice director of the whole conservatory. And the good news is he's coming here in the middle of April and playing uh, for the students with the Julia String Quartet. They're going to do Schumann Piano Quintet right here on the stage. Uh, it's the day after Easter, so you're all welcome to come hear them and, and also meet them. This was also a picture of these, they're talking to the students, Montclair students, four years ago. And at that time, they did a recital at the Van Vleck house. They did four hands, and there you see their four hands. Uh, four hand music. In Milan, also, you'll be overwhelmed by the architecture. There's the famous uh, Cathedral Duomo, the Duomo of Milan. And in this picture, you can't see the doors, but if you get really close to the doors, you see these amazing amazing, intricate, beautiful 
sculptors of various religious scenes. And of course, Italy the food. Okay, pasta. <laughs> the best you can possibly imagine. There are no words to describe how good it is. And also chocolate, chocolate. And of course, the most famous, one of the most famous chocolates of Italy is the Nutella, where you see everywhere, even in the hotel, you have a Nutella pump. You can just keep pumping as much as you want. Uh, and of course, gelato. Every flavor you can imagine and even more. That's all available to you. Fashion, yes. Milan, of all of Italy, Milan's the capital of fashion. <laughs> so a lot of shopping going on. Now we'll move to our second destination, Graz, Austria. Again, you have to fly there. And then how you leave the plane is your business. <laughs> so Graz is one of the smaller cities in, in Austria. It's on the, can you see this pointer? It's in the lower uh, southeastern corner of Austria right there. And here we offer, again, the reason we say spring semester uh, for the same, similar reason, the calendar is such that if you went there for the fall semester, you would be late coming back here for the spring. But spring, or even the whole year, is very available. Um, and again, the details of, of living there, uh, courses you would take, that can all be worked out once we know of your interest in this. Here's a scene of downtown Graz. You can see it's not one of the larger cities, but it's very beautiful. Um, Hugo Wolf, the song composer, is born in Graz. So there's not only this statue uh, of his head, there's also a street named after him. You can visit his house as a museum and so forth. This is the uh, one view of the music building. They even have an institute for jazz, its entire building. And a modern building, not only the old traditional, but this very modern building for new music. Here's their electronic music studio. Opera. And this is the, the woman you see standing in, in white sweater. That's Sandra Tamam. She's a professor here during the spring semester currently. And she teaches special piano techniques of the Calvin piano approach. And she went to Graz for five days last April, just last April, and did presentations uh, for the students there. We've had several students go to Graz, and this is Ashley Bruta, who was one of our talented clarinet students. Here she is playing a recital. At, uh, on one of the stages there. Also, Marissa Minogue, I think she was an oboe player, is that right? She was an oboe player. They were both there for a study abroad in Graz. This is a lake very nearby Graz uh, with some other students. And here the, uh, the scholarship students, both of uh, their own and ours, are drinking Glühwein, which translates as glow wine, G-L-O-W, because after you drink it, you really feel a strong glow. And it's, it's, it's similar to malt cider. It's a warm drink, so the, the alcohol has a very quick effect on you. So there, you can see how happy you are. you want to add any remarks about that? Oh, that's coming up. So in addition to our music program in Graz, the city of Montclair has its own special sister city relationship with Graz, and it's actually the oldest sister city connection of any that occurred not long after World War II. And um, Domenico will say more about that. 
Right, so there's, there's two ways to apply to study at the University of Music and Performing Arts in Graz. You can apply as a regular exchange student, as we've been discussing, uh, where you would go for one semester or an academic year. Um, there's also an opportunity to apply to go for a full academic year and study there on full scholarship. So um, for about 60 or 70 years, we've uh, had this sister city relationship, and during that time, um, the city of Graz and Montclair State University have exchanged over 100 students back and forth. The vast majority have not been with the music school, they've been with the University of Graz, another university in the city. But for the past several years, this program has been opened up as well for that special scholarship exchange. So if you're interested, um, that scholarship, to, every year, two Montclair State students receive that scholarship. So it's competitive, but not with anybody outside of the university. Um, Two students are selected. You will spend the following year, academic year, in Graz at University of Music and Performing Arts. Uh, almost everything will be paid for you. It will be, uh, it will cover your tuition and fees, your housing in the city of Graz, and you'll also receive a small stipend in euros uh, to help cover some of your personal expenses while you're here. So it's really an excellent opportunity. Um, the deadline for applications for that scholarship is always in the first week of December. It hasn't been announced yet for next year, but you should look out for that as well. Yes, it's a very generous scholarship, very wonderful opportunity. And you'd be surprised how, in the last years, how many music students have received it. So don't be afraid or bashful about applying. Okay, now Norway, Christensen, Norway. Again, you must fly there. People think of Norway as very distant and cold and snowy. It is. <laughs> but this particular university is at the very, very southern tip of Norway. Right. This is an old school pointer, it's not laser, it's a battery operated, I'm not sure. But at the very bottom, the lowest Christians at the very bottom. So it does have a more moderate climate, not, not unlike New England, North America, actually. Uh, there, and while you're living there, there's many beautiful parts of Norway you can visit, absolutely breathtaking see in this photo. Uh, if you go to Oslo, which is the capital, about four or five hours on the train from Christensen, uh, they have a beautiful park. Here's a marionette guy working on pianist. Uh, here's a dog walker. So you have many opportunities to see really interesting things. Uh, the name of the small university is Agder University. And by the way, about the Norwegian language, it is a very beautiful language, uh, but what you should know is everybody, I repeat, everybody speaks English. I've been there, I've been in Norway three times, and I have yet to meet anyone who doesn't speak fluent English. Just, you, you know, shoeshine boys, uh, clerks, taxi drivers, everybody speaks English. So that's absolutely not a concern. And at the university, they teach in English. Often they teach in English for their own Norwegian students because it's become like the recognized international required language. Uh, this is a picture of Christensen, the actual town where the university is, and it is as beautiful as you see in this photo. They have a new, newly built new campus, which is where the music school is, and that's a picture of the whole university. Another shot of that. Here's the guitar studio. This is a quote from, uh, I don't think it was one of our students, but um, such, um, an international student who's been there. Here's a group of random students <laughs> at the university. <laughs> one thing you will notice, they tend to be tall. I, I don't consider myself short, but among the students I, I've taught there, they're all taller than me. So, it's just an interesting fact. And 
there's uh, towards sunset. There, part of the city is a pedestrian area only where people walk or bike instead of uh, drive. So I took this picture on one of my earlier trips because I realized you would never see this kind of scene in America. about Octor University is a full comprehensive university, not just a conservatory. So it's just something to keep in mind if you want to go abroad for the semester and maybe in addition to taking, or for a year, in addition to taking your music major requirements, you'll also have access to take and fulfill gen ed requirements or other kinds of requirements that you might not in some of the conservatories. So there's a different option. Yeah, for example, they have a survey of Scandinavian history and it's taught in English, and you'll learn a lot not only about Norway, but about the whole area, the five countries of Scandinavia. Uh, Moscow. Now, the, mo the, ne the next two cities are not so active these years, the last few years, but they're still available, but I do want to present them. Moscow, Russia. Moscow, as you know, is on the western end of huge, the huge country of Russia. Uh, a few years ago, Dr. Heather Buchanan took our choir there. I don't know if you knew that. It's probably before your time. And you can see her uh, on the, the right-hand side of the group. That's our choir. You recognize some of the students? And the upper photo on the right is the the Great Hall of the Moscow Conservatory. And the lower is St. Basil's Cathedral, which is always everyone's favorite object of photography. It's, a, it's right in Red Square, very beautiful. Um, again, part of the program there, you would learn not only your instrument, but you would learn uh, you would learn some Russian language, you would learn about Russian culture. The very first year we created this program, we sent five students, and Professor Mark Packman went with them for the first week to, to get things smoothed out. And, uh, and they really had a good time. Some of the photos are sent to me by those students who went for the first time. This is a picture from the Moscow Zoo from the zoo, it's not of the zoo. Uh, there's seven buildings which maintain that old uh, Stalinistic uh, architecture, that's one of them. This is the conservatory itself. This was a random lady selling magazines on the street, but I liked her face a lot. The closest she ever came to smiling. <laughs> uh, another shot of the, of the Moscow Conservatory, which is named after Tchaikovsky. And there you see the famous statue of Tchaikovsky. Anyone who goes there must have their photo taken with at the Tchaikovsky statue. There are dormitories there, and this is a picture the student sent me from the window of the dormitory. And believe it or not, the dormitories do have pianos in them. So if you wake up in the middle of the night, you really need to solve a fingering problem. It's a bit <laughs> uh, This was about 14 years ago, a concert we gave at, the, at Sviatoslav Richter's apartment, which was is now a museum. Uh, so there you see me in the center, and to the right is Professor Mark Packman, and on the extreme right is Jeff Gold, Professor Jeffrey Gold. And in the back on the wall, that beautiful painting was actually done by Richter. He was not only a great pianist, but he was a very gifted painter, and you see lots, of, the apartment is filled with lots of his own. This is in a park 
at sunset, very beautiful sky. Do you want to say anything about Russia? We know Russia is not, as politically, is not always uh, lined up with us, but you cannot deny that the music, the history of it, the music is just, um, you know, it's created many, many masterpieces, and there's a lot to learn there. The fifth school, also, we don't have any current students in Budapest, but we do have our own um, Anita, Anita Balaj, the cellist who's here, maybe some of you know her. She's, uh, she's from Budapest. <laughs> so Budapest is centrally, centrally located in Hungary, you see on the right. And again, if you decide you're interested to go there, you would um, meet with us and we talk in detail about what your program would be. They don't have dormitories, but that's always an issue we can solve. We can find you, help find you apartments or private housing. Um, it is one of the most beautiful cities of Europe. It has the Danube River. Danube River runs through it, and there's seven bridges, seven very famous and beautiful bridges across the river. That is the academy, the Liszt Academy. It's hard to see, but that's a statue of Franz Liszt himself, right in the center. And that's the inside, very beautiful and acoustically beautiful too. Wonderful sounds in the main hall of the academy. Now these were two students uh, about six years ago from Montclair who went there. Jesse Meltzer is on the left, he's a trombone major, right, trombone. And on the right is Jack Blaskevich, who's a very talented pianist, and he decided to pursue musicology, and he's finishing his doctorate at Eastman School of Music right now. And they went together, they were good friends, and they also sent me some of these photos you will see. That's going down into the subway in Budapest. This is a really large and beautiful uh, food market. Instead of outdoor market, it's indoors. You can stock up and make, make your own soup and all kinds of meals there. That's one of the government buildings in Budapest. This was actually on one of their side trips to a smaller town. Debrecen, I think, is the second largest city in, in, in Hungary. And that's in Debrecen, uh, one of the, uh, the parks and government buildings. Oh, I took, I took this in Budapest. I was just walking on the street, minding my own business. And I suddenly saw this bear in one of the windows behind bars, of course. And I overcome, I was so curious, I overcame any curiosity and just knocked on the door. And this woman answered the door, and behind her she had like dozens and dozens of bears. She had panda bears and poo bears. And she didn't speak one word of English, and my Hungarian really doesn't exist. It's just like this speak Hungarian. But she was so friendly and I figured out that she packages these and sends them out mail order. So all, all the bears were wrapped in plastic, which is kind of frightening in its own way. <laughs> but who knows, if you go there, maybe you'll also have the opportunity to meet her. So now that you're all ready, how do you get started? Yes. So first of all, talk to your teacher or your advisor. And do it in advance, even if some of you are freshmen. You know, junior year is, is optimum for studying abroad, but it could be your sophomore year or even senior. Um, meet with Domenica Dominguez, who's right here. And she will work out. Okay, but what's important as an action step, what you really need to do 
is get references already. Start getting reference letters from your studio teacher, from your coordinator of your instrument or, or academic advisor, major ensemble director if you're in the band or orchestra or choir, and have them submit the letters to me or one of the other members of the international committee. Okay. And once we approve your interest and application, then you put together an audition tape, your transcripts, again, we can help you with all those details. So that's what I meant, you approved by the committee means you're nominated by the International Committee. And you would also decide if you're going to spend one or two semesters in your country. And yes, absolutely, you get MSU credits for study abroad. So uh, the first three programs that we talked about, Milan and Graz and um, Christmas and Otter in Norway, all three of those are exchange programs. So what that means for you is um, once you are accepted to go, nominated by us and accepted at the school, as um, Professor Witten mentioned, you'll be dual enrolled during that semester. You maintain your enrollment here at Montclair State and you're enrolled at the university. You pay Montclair State tuition and fees. So uh, you won't be charged any tuition and fees at the host institution. You just pay whatever you normally pay during a semester here. So if you get any kind of financial aid at all, federal aid, state aid, or uh, grants or scholarships from Montclair State, all of those will apply to the program. Uh, the last two that we talked about in Russia and Hungary structured a little bit differently. Uh, we, you still be enrolled here during the semester that you're abroad, but we will not charge you tuition and fees. They charge you whatever they charge for students who are coming in. But typically, it's about the same or less than what you pay for a semester here. So either way, the cost shouldn't be too much more. Right. And just to clarify, you, you do not pay two tuitions. You only pay the month per tuition. You do not pay an additional tuition at, at the school that you're visiting. Again, there you have um, the names of Domenica and myself. Now, we can answer your three questions. Will I be paying more than the usual tuition? No. Okay. You will have to pay to get there, the airfare. You will, uh, you will pay for living there, but hey, here you have to also pay for living here. So, you pay for living, you pay for food, but that will happen wherever you are. Uh, do I need to know foreign language? No, it's helpful, and you will be taking classes once or twice a week in the, in the country you're visiting. But as every year goes by, more and more people know English in these countries we've mentioned. So, uh, of course, it's helpful and fun and, and useful if you can speak even if you can speak a few sentences, it always helps. But no, it's not a requirement to know the foreign language. We can also find you classes that will be taught in English. You're, we can also find you a studio teacher who will be able to teach you in English on your instrument. That's really a great advantage. And the third question, will it lengthen my studies at MSU? Uh, sometimes it will. But other times, again, it depends on your individual case. But even if it lengthens your study by one semester, don't forget those great regrets we showed you at the beginning, that years from now you'll regret that you missed the opportunity to study in another country. Or is it going to have anything to do? No, it's true. That's my one regret from undergrad, that I didn't study for And there is a fourth question I didn't add, and that's, what if you're a graduate student and you still take advantage of all these programs? The answer is yes. This is not limited to undergraduates. Graduate students, we can work out what you want to take, what country you want to go to. So it is open for grads and undergrads. 
Now, we've presented the five that exist for Cali students, but I wanted to tell you about two more locations, two more places in the world where we do have some kind of program. It's not exactly student for student exchange. In some cases, so far, it's only professor exchange. For example, in Jerusalem, Israel, we've had a few professors come, come to a Cali school for a few days to do lectures and teaching. And uh, I have been there a few times to the Jerusalem Academy of Music to also do presentations and uh, lecture recitals and master classes. So if you do want to study the Jerusalem Academy, we can make that work for you. Uh, it's not as well established in exchange, but we do have that. Here's, um, sorry it's out of focus, but it's a picture of the unusual music building at the Jerusalem Academy. We have some random guitar students. <laughs> and here's one of the smaller chamber orchestras. Okay, the other location which we do have a connection with is in Shanghai, China. That's a picture of downtown Shanghai. And we have had a connection with the East China Normal University for a number of years. We've only started activating the music for the last two years. But how long has it been? We've had other, the linguistics, the linguistics department has had exchanges for quite a while, like seven or eight. Like, what's the name of that Chinese professor's name? Longxing, yeah. Wei Longxing. He's a professor here, and he's often, he often takes uh, other professors to East China Normal and invites professors. But the good news for, me, for our music department is we do have um, a, a new program with our music department where we invite music students to come here and they, they take part in a one-year study here and it's part of their three years master's degree at East China. In other words, it's three years, their first and third year is East China, their middle, second year is here at Montclair. And here's some of the students, oh, sorry. <laughs> here's some of the students and here's some of our current students Four of the five students are in this picture. And we, we certainly welcome more of them to come. Now, if you're a Montclair student and you do desire to go to East China, I'm sure we can work that out. Okay. So, welcome to the end of our presentation and we, we would like to hear your questions.